It is the evening of December 20, 1915, and as the last of the Anzac forces on Gallipoli make their way to the landing craft in Anzac Cove to withdraw to the troop ships, the air is still and quiet, save for the occasional crack of rifle fire coming from the Australian lines. But there will be no soldiers manning the parapet and defences, just water, bully beef tins, and the invention from an architect from Carlton, Victoria. Today we have the story of the inventor of the self-firing troop rifle. Welcome to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast. I'm Ross Manuel, I'm an amateur historian and writer, and this week I look into the life, service, and historical impact of the inventor of the drip rifle, William Charles Scully. Like many people, I knew about the drip rifle as an object and its importance to the Gallipoli withdrawal completely removed from its creator. So when I started working on this podcast, I knew at some point I had to find out just who was responsible for its creation and see what else they did. And this is how I stumbled upon William Scurry. William Charles Scurry was born the 30th of October, 1895 in Carlton, a suburb of Melbourne, Victoria. He was the fourth surviving child of native-born William Charles Scurry, an architectural modeler, and his English wife, Bessie Preston. He attended Ascot Vale State School before he trained as an architectural modeler and joined the family firm. While in school, he served in the senior cadets as part of the compulsory training scheme and then progressed to the citizen forces in 1913, where he served as a colour sergeant and then received a commission as a second lieutenant in May 1914, while assigned to the 58th Infantry Essendon Rifles. Following the outbreak of hostilities in the First World War, Scurry would relinquish his commission within the militia and on the 19th of July 1915, with the consent from his mother, enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force and was assigned to the 8th Reinforcements to the 7th Infantry Battalion. He departed Australia aboard the troop ship HMAT Ansice on the 26th of August, and in my research, I was able to determine that the 8th Reinforcements to the 7th Battalion travelled with the 8th Reinforcements to the 16th Battalion, the same unit that David Twining was a part of, which meant that chances are the two of them probably passed in the corridor. Bound initially for Egypt, he eventually landed on Gallipoli on the 11th of November, where he would be officially taken on strength with the 7th Infantry Battalion. At this point in the Gallipoli campaign, the Allied August offensive had failed miserably, and public opinion from the campaign had started to turn against the Entente powers with the introduction of Bulgaria to the Central Powers. Groups of dissident officers had already started raising the idea of evacuating the month before, and while General Sir Ian Hamilton, Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, would dismiss these plans, it could not stop the rumours from running throughout the Anzac positions, especially as the cold winter months started to set in and the soldiers started to become afflicted by the elements. While on the peninsula, Scurry would be promoted to Lance Corporal on the 4th of December, and like the others, would have heard the rumours, and once he was satisfied that they were substantiated, he began to wonder what would happen to the troops in the boats and on the piers once the Turks realised what was happening. He wrote later, It occurred to me that if we could leave our rifles firing, we might get away surely. And added, At the time, I didn't think anybody dreamed that we would all get away. Drawing on his architectural experience and a lifelong fascination with the bush ranger Ned Kelly, he, along with a mate, Private Alfred Hughes Bunty Lawrence, looked into the concept to try and convert the standard issue bolt-action short magazine Lee Enfield rifle into something capable of firing independently to allow the Entente forces to withdraw without the Ottoman forces being aware. At its core, the premise of the drip or pop-off rifle is very simple. Essentially, the rifle is mounted to a bracket up against the parapet with a piece of string looped around the trigger and one end attached to a suspended container, usually a bully beef container or jam tin. A second container placed above it with a hole in the side would leak its contents into the suspended container. And once it reached a sufficient weight, the cord would pull taut against the trigger and it would fire. A single round. Now there is a variant of the pop-off rifle that ran a string holding back the trigger through a candle, which once it burnt down, severed the string and released the trigger. This rifle would be mounted vertically, not horizontally, but I've not been able to determine through my research who was responsible for inventing it, as so well known was the Scurry's design. Scurry's initial experiments are reminiscent of an hourglass, with sand being used to drip out of the upper container into the lower, and the additional weight would add pressure to the trigger, allowing it to fire. Eventually, Scurry and Bunty decided that water would be far more effective. However, they encountered a problem. Water is a valuable commodity on Gallipoli, as it had to be brought ashore and was strictly rationed to one point per day per soldier. Thankfully, Anzac mateship came to the fore, Scurry recalled 
Permission to go to the beach for salt water was refused, so Bunty gave me a whole quart as he'd drawn a double ration, which happened to be available on the condition that he drew none the next day. These sacrifices would pay dividends, as the concept would be successful, and after demonstrating his invention to headquarters staff, he was told that the rifles would be used, 12 on each battalion front, over 8 battalion fronts, in the final stages of the evacuation. In order to continue the illusion that the Australian trenches were still manned, the rifles were set to fire at indeterminate periods. Timing was controlled by the rate in which the water dripped, the size of the whole saw to that. For three weeks before the 19th of December, troops were quietly shipped out of Anzac until about 10,000 men remained. The self-firing rifles were fixed in the trench lines on the night of the 19th and 20th of December, and rear parties were detailed to fill the water tins at the very last moment. Scurry remained with the 7th Battalion's rear party, and he noted that all the way down the beach, it sounded like any other night. With sporadic rifle fire breaking the silence, his pop-off rifle had foiled the Turks, and evacuation had been successfully effected arguably the only unqualified success of the entire campaign. In recognition for his invention, Scurry was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal and was mentioned in dispatches. As the AIF was rotated back to Egypt, it underwent a period of expansion and retraining, where the existing two Australian divisions were doubled, with each battalion gaining a sister battalion, comprised partly of Gallipoli veterans and fresh recruits from Australia, with the intent being that the veterans would train up the replacements, imparting the lessons gained from the campaign. In January 1916, Scurry was promoted to sergeant and on the 20th of February, commissioned as a second lieutenant. He would then be transferred to the newly raised 58th Battalion in March. After additional training, Scurry and the 58th Battalion would travel to France on the 23rd of June 1916 and assumed positions far behind the line at Steenbeck near the French-Belgian border. This was to prepare for Australia's introduction to the Western Front. Shortly after arriving on the 5th of July, he would be formally requested by commander of the 15th Brigade, Brigadier General Harold Edward Pompey Elliott, to form the 15th Light Trench Mortar Battery and would be promoted to the rank of temporary captain. Just a fortnight later, he would use his eight guns with considerable effect during the Battle of Fromel. The Battle of Fromel was Australia's introduction to the Western Front and is, in retrospect, a bloody initiation to modern warfare. With over 5,500 Australians of the 5th Division becoming casualties, with almost 2,000 of them being killed in action or died of wounds, and some 400 being captured, this is believed to be the greatest loss by a single division in 24 hours during the entirety of the First World War, and this one battle is considered to be the most tragic event in Australia's military history. Scurry would survive the battle and would continue to command the 15th Light Mortar Battery until September 3rd when he was wounded at Petion in France while examining a new type of fuse that had been used in an unexploded German bomb. The weapon blew up, injuring him in the process, in the chest and face, and shattering his right index finger, which later had to be amputated. Fragments of the metal blinded him in the right eye, and he was evacuated to England. Pompey Elliot wrote at the time that Scurry was one of the best and most enthusiastic officers in my brigade, without exception. And for his work with the battery, Scurry was awarded the Military Cross and confirmed as captain in December 1916. In June 1917, having recovered from most of his injuries, he was sent to the 1st Anzacs Corps School at Avaloy, France, as an instructor and from May 1918 was its chief instructor. Between courses, he chose to return to the front line and in late 1918, at Lou Wood near Bray, he found a platoon whose officers had been lost and led them through the fighting. Arriving back in Melbourne in May 1919, Scurry rejoined his father's firm on the tw and on the 29th of January 1920 at St John's Catholic Church, Clifton Hill, he married Doris Agatha Barry, an Australian army nurse who had served in France. In September, the vision in Scurry's left eye failed, and in 1923, his poor eyesight forced him to give up his work as an architectural modeller. He then became an orchidist in Sylvain, but eventually had to give up all exertion to preserve the 15% vision he had left in his eyes. Not to be perturbed, at the outset of the Second World War, Scurry would re-enlist in the army on the 5th of September 1940 and serve with the 17th Garrison Battalion at the rank of captain. He later would take on the post of Commandant of the Tatura Internment Camp at the rank of Major before being discharged on the 8th of October 1945. After the war, he lived quietly in Croydon, Victoria, where, survived by his wife and four daughters, he died of a coronary occlusion on the 28th of December 1963 at the age of 68. He was buried at Lilydale Cemetery. Like so many others that I've covered in this podcast, 
Scarry's invention of the drip rifle on Gallipoli rapidly became separated from the man who invented it, and even though it was a critical piece of the evacuation, it wasn't his only achievement. Even though legally blind, Scurry once again answered the call of his country and served proudly in the second global conflict. And for that and all his other achievements, we are eternally grateful. And that is the story of William Charles Scully. Next time on the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, he was called the Flying Cowboy and was known for his magnificent fighting spirit and great skill during the Second World War. But to his family, he was the much-loved son and brother who gave his all for his country while serving as the commanding officer of No. 76 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, during the fighting at Millen Bay. Next time on I Was Only Doing My Job is the final episode of Season 1, Squadron Leader, Peter St. George Bruce Turnbull. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. I would really appreciate it and would help out the show if you would share this or leave a comment on Spotify or Google Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts as it really helps others find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode with photos, show notes and transcripts, head over to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram. Don't worry, there'll be a link in the description. If you want to follow me for more history hijinks and random nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at at Doc Winters. Once again, my name is Ross. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.